Hi everyone and uh, welcome to this uh, lecture. Uh, even though I have been teaching a lot because uh, I also did my PhD uh, at Maastricht University, this is my first uh, digital lecture. For you it's probably business as usual already after the last month. Uh, for me this is the only lecture I normally deliver uh, every year. My name is uh, Philip. Um, I'm an economist. Uh, I did my PhD at Maastricht University. I also did my bachelor and master at Maastricht University. I did my PhD on uh, higher education. So I looked at the decisions that students uh, make in higher education and um, the effect of uh, such uh, decisions later on the labor market. Um, and after my PhD, I stayed on with Maastricht University as a, um, as a research fellow by now. So I still do a bit of research, but mainly after my PhD, I started my own company. And that company is uh, called CASE, uh, which is short for Candidate Select. So we are involved in helping companies decide who they want to get to know for an interview, who they want to hire. Um, and this is why I'm talking to you today, because um, I will be talking about a bit about theory. I will try to link this to whatever you've been reading in your textbook uh, lately. But I can also tell, talk a lot about practice, because essentially we are offering uh, solutions for companies to probably select based on diagnostic principles um, their applicants and um, yeah let's do this if you have any questions I think uh, Stefan uh, scheduled uh, a Q&A session so um, then you can also talk to me uh, in person and uh, ask me things that are unclear um, this was constructed to be a very interactive lecture because I think uh, lectures where only one person is talking and all the others have to listen are quite boring. Um, this is not going to work out today because I have to pre-record it. Um, so yeah, don't don't think me of being don't think of me as being weird just because I will be talking uh, quite a lot to myself and I will be asking myself questions. That's because this is sort of the style of the lecture. Okay, so I am here because um, from case um, I can talk a lot about. Um, uh, employee selection and practice and at the same time I'm looking at these kind of processes from uh, from an academic research perspective um, as a research fellow here in Maastricht um, I'm working with Lex Bochans who is a professor um, of labor markets and social economics and he's also doing lots of um, research on education so what we are going to do today is we're going to look at the theory behind uh, selection and signals um, why do we need signals? How do we select? Then I'm going to tell you what CASE is doing, um, how we try to solve these things. Um, we derive diagnostic criteria from educational degrees um, at CASE. So I will be talking about this, how we can use um, education, uh, an educational degree in candidate selection. And I will talk a bit more about selection processes in practice. Um, so how companies do this, um, how these kind of processes normally look like, which is also interesting for you because um, it's not just the content of this course, but once you are done studying, you will be in this situation that you are applying with uh, a company. And um, well, maybe it's interesting to know how they are making the decision on whether they're going to hire you or not. Um, I'm going to skip self-selection. This is something you should have been uh, talking about in your course. So meaning the probation model where the idea is that um, only people who sort of think that they can make probation, that they apply to a certain um, position. And when we talk about selection today, that means we're talking about the active selection uh, a company is doing. Um, so we're looking at different selection techniques. We're looking at signals. And these are the kind of things that you should be reading in your textbook now or the last week um, we're gonna have to see about that so um, <clears throat> my first very interactive question now would be what screening techniques do you know um, and then the answers I usually get is well I know CV screening where people look at the CV and then you can go into more detail and say well when they look at a CV they look at the different items that are on CV, so they could be looking at education, they could be looking at prior experience, if you already have work experience, certainly rather limited for graduates that are applying for their first job uh, after university, but much more important for senior positions where people really have a, have a lot of experience already. Um, 
But there are other uh, screening techniques that you could employ too. You could um, you can uh, go into diagnostics, so you can uh, do tests. You can um, ask uh, certain questions to people, and such a test could be that you're testing for skills. So you could test a certain programming language. Um, you can you can there are some tests there, um, not always very good, but um, where they try to sort of recreate the job, um, where they sort of position you in, in, in front of, a, of an email inbox, for example, and then certain emails pop in and you have to react to those. Um, but then there are also more psychological tests in, in the sense of, an, of doing an, a cognitive test, an IQ test, or um, a, a test for personality, and we're going to talk about all these things uh, later. Why do we do this? Why do we need to screen? We have to do it because there's an information asymmetry. Um, and adverse selection is one example of an uh, uh, information asymmetry. There could also be moral hazards, but um, in this scenario where we're trying to hire someone, adverse selection plays a role, meaning that um, the people who make the decision who they want to hire, they have incomplete information. They have less information than the person who is applying. The person who is applying knows whether he or she is a, is a, good, a good guy, a good girl, a good worker, whether he or she can be productive. But the company does not know that. So the company will try to sort of develop a prediction, an estimate um, on whether someone is going to be uh, good on the job um, that they are supposed to do. Um, and for that, uh, signals can play a role. So signals help um, to balance information asymmetries in this case of adverse selection. And um, we're going to talk a bit more about this on the next slides. Okay, I think we did answer those questions, so I'm going to skip through. How does adverse selection work in more detail? We have a buyer of a product or we have an employee, um, no, an employer, sorry, not an employee, an employer, um, who is not able to assess the quality of something. So if you're buying a car and you're not very well versed with cars or general mechanical engineering or something like I am, then your uh, information on the quality of the product is really limited because it's really hard for you to say whether the product is of good quality or bad quality. Of course, you can look at certain proxies, but it's, it's hard for you to determine. And the same kind of applies when you're an employer and you're looking to hire someone because you don't know whether that person is, uh, is, is going to be productive. You don't know whether that person is going to be smart, whether it's going to be, he or she is going to be motivated and all these kind of things play a great role. So. Um, yeah, what happens is that because you don't know that, you're only willing to pay sort of the average price. Meaning that if you buy a car and you don't know whether it's good or bad quality, we live in a very simple world for the moment, so there's only good quality or bad quality cars, you will sort of be willing to pay the average price, right? So the half, if 50% if of the cars are good and 50% of the cars are bad, you will just calculate the average. And the same kind of um, happens with applicants. Um, especially at the start of their career, when no one knows whether they're good or bad, we have less um, less um, spread, we have less uh, variance in the salaries that people earn. So it's, everything is a bit closer together because the companies don't know whether someone is going to perform very well or very bad. So you're kind of only willing to pay the average. But then as a person who's selling a good product, a good car, you're not willing to sell that car for the average because it's less than the value you know. And that's the problem with information symmetries. You know that this is a good car. The person who wants to buy it is only willing to pay you the average price for the car. And you know that's too little, so you're not going to sell it. And that leads to a market failure. So then only bad cars will be sold for a value that is too high. Good cars will uh, um, get, go out of the market. The, the average price has to adjust, uh, weighted average. Um, and in the end, this leads to a market failure where only bad cars are being sold. Um, in this very simplistic scenario with good and bad cars, this is the this is the outcome, and um, this is sort of what's, what what started this adverse selection idea when Akalov, um, uh, an economist who, who also won a Nobel Nobel Prize in, in economics, um, when he started the idea of adverse selection and how these information asymmetries can play a role. And the same we could see um, also in the example of the labor market. So the employer doesn't know um, whether someone is a good worker or not. Um, only willing to pay the average salary, but for that amount of money, workers are, the good workers are not willing to work, so we could also end up in a situation where we have a market failure. Of course, this doesn't happen like that in real life, because labor markets are much more complicated than that. But um, it's, it's a good starting point to understand why these information asymmetries play a role and why we should think about them. 
This is called a lemons market. Um, so if we end up in this market failure that only the bad things are being sold, um, these are referred to as lemons. So only the, the bad stuff, the lemons are being traded and there's a market failure for the good product. So <clears throat> why do we have signals? Let's stay in the example of a, of a car, for example. Um, cars normally have a certificate. So uh, here in Germany, um, cars do get, uh, are required to um, go through a test normally every two years and then they're checked whether they are safe to drive and they get a certificate, a TÜV certificate in Germany. And I, I, I guess there's something similar in the Netherlands. I've never owned a Dutch a car with a Dutch license plate so far, so I don't know, I don't know the process behind that, but uh, I guess it will be very similar. Um, and this is a signal. This signals the person who's buying the car that it's a safe car, that it's not, I mean, we're not, we're not living in the simple world with only good and bad cars, but it, it's a signal to show that, well, this can't be a really bad car because then it wouldn't get the certificate. And this already tells us about um, the requirements for a signal to be um, efficient, to be productive, because a signal is only productive if it's not attainable for everyone. So if all cars would get a certificate, then this certificate as a signal is completely worthless because it doesn't help in separating between good and bad cars. Um, that's the example here. But we can also carry that to the um, recruitment process. If a signal can be obtained by everyone, it's not a good signal. So if we think about, for example, what you're doing at the moment, uh, going to university, higher education, that is a signal. So if you can apply for a job later, you can show your Maastricht diploma and say, well, here, look, I'm a smart guy. Maastricht University says I'm a smart guy, so you should hire me. Um, that's something you could do. So the question then is, is this a good signal? And how can it become a good signal? Because um, can everyone go to Maastricht University? How hard is it? Do you have to put a lot of effort and then it's working? Or do you also have to be extraordinarily smart? I, I studied in Maastricht myself. I think in many courses you can solve it uh, with effort. Um, and in that sense, uh, the signal then helps to differentiate between people who are not willing to put the effort and people who are putting the effort. But the signal is quite um, obtainable in that sense. So um, we have to think a lot um, how we can get most information out of, out of such signals. And we'll talk about that. Um, but in order to do my duty as an, as an economist, uh, I'm, I'm not going around all equations here. So um, theoretically, in our world with good and bad products, um, we need a separating equilibrium in order to make a signal work. And um, what these equations, um, these conditions in a sense, what they tell us is that um, only if this is true, a signal can be efficient. So the first one is the signal should be cheaper for high quality applicants than it is for low quality applicants, or it should be cheaper or easier to obtain um, the signal in the car example. So what does that mean? If um, you are very smart and you are very motivated and you're willing to put a lot of effort, it should be easier or less costly for you to obtain the diploma at Maastricht University. And I think that is true because cost is also measured in terms of time, right? You have opportunity costs. So if you study longer or if you have to study more, it is much harder for you to, to finish, to graduate. So um, in a sense, yes, the costs are lower for high ability students than they are for low ability students. And then we have to see whether um, there's a difference in who obtains this signal in, the sense the diploma from Maastricht University and there we look at the difference in income so y is typically income in economics and um, yh minus yh bar that is the additional income you get from having um, the diploma from having the certificate and um, we do have proxies for this by the way so um, this is now really close to what I did my PhD on um, there's a return to education uh, in the literature it's usually around six to seven percent so every year you study more um, also here at Maastricht University, while also making progress, I would say, your um, salary will increase by six to seven percent. So there is a return to education. There is a return to, to obtaining this, um, this signal. And we can talk a bit more about why there is a return, but we'll do that later. But this return needs to be higher than the cost um, for high ability individuals so that they obtain it, because then it's rational for them. They gain more than they lose in trying to obtain the signal. But in order to make the signal really efficient in this simple world, um, the low ability students should not obtain the signal. And for them, it must be that 
um, the income gained from having the signal is less than the costs because then they will not try to do it because there's nothing they can gain from it. And then we speak of a separating equilibrium where the good, the good cars, the good students, they get the certificate and the bad cars or the bad students, they don't get it. And then with the certificate, you can perfectly differentiate um, between the good and the bad and the signal is perfectly working. So yeah, is education a good signal? And uh, well, for one, we're not living in the simple world where there's only good and bad. Uh, luckily, we have uh, many, many more uh, states that we can have. We have an entire ability distribution and all that. So in that sense, education is a signal. It's not a perfect signal. It's far from a perfect signal. So we have lots of effects that are not correlated with ability that also are very um, predictive of who obtains education. And for one example, for example, is social economic status. Um, students from low social economic uh, status families, so families where, for example, the parents did not go to higher education, they did not obtain um, uh, such a diploma, they are much likely to end up, uh, much less likely to end up in higher education. And we know that this is normally not really correlated with ability, it correlates with certain learning outcomes, but not so much with the, the real cognitive ability. Um, and this is a sign where education is not fair in a sense. Um, and that also, of course, makes it a less efficient signal. But there are also other reasons why education is not perfectly predictive of um, later um, ability, and that is it's a different context. Maybe you are, you are a nerd and you're not good with people, and you're very successful in education because you can do everything on yourself. I don't think that is true for Maastricht University because you have to do lots of group works and lots of presentations. So being a, a nerd with only very um, abilities in, in, in one area that will not, not get you very far. But we could construct a case like this. And then this is a very different context than what you have to do later later in the job market. And different jobs, of course, have very different requirements. So think about what you need to be good at in order to be a salesperson. That is very different from what you have to be good at in order to be an accountant or a researcher. So um, education is not perfect in that sense because it requires certain skills and your job might require different skills. But normally these things are correlated. So it's not completely off either, right? It's not perfect, but it's not bad um, at the same time. And, uh, we can think about uh, how we can get much more information out of it than just looking um, at whether someone got, an, got a diploma, yes or no. That is the very easy certificate case. We could also be looking um, at the grade, at the grade point average. Maybe that already has some information. We can be looking at the institution. And these are all things that we're doing at case. Um, okay, so yes, in order to have a signal that is good, it needs to create a separating equilibrium. Um, and then the question remains, are there other arguments for education? So when we talk about a return to education, is that just a return that you get because you have the diploma and now companies are willing to pay more for you? Right? So that is the pure signaling argument. When we talked about the additional income in the equations, uh, I said that you earn more with the diploma. That could be because you are smarter now and that is human capital accumulation. This is something you will be talking about, right? So you get smarter, you learn something, you accumulate human capital that can be used productively once you enter the labor market. That is one argument. But at the same time, the other argument is that you earn more because you have the signal, right? And the signal tells the employer that you're smart. And of course, they want to play, pay more money to smart people than to less smart people. Um, and that also gives you additional income. Um, and we need to differentiate between the two. So whenever we talk about the return to education, maybe I was not perfectly precise with that um, on, on my previous slide, we talk about the causal effect to education and that causal effect is normally related to an accumulation of human capital. Whereas the signal is sort of not a causal effect, having the signal did not make you smarter, but it's an effect that leads to more income because you can now demonstrate that you are smart uh, to other people. And that means uh, your market value will increase because they believe you now that you are actually really smart. Um, so back to screening techniques. Um, there are two different um, things that we can talk about. We can talk about checking 
credentials and there we normally check signals so we look at a cv we look at a high school diploma we look at things that someone did or we can do things that try to measure productivity and these are then the assessment tests that i talked about this could be an assessment center this uh, could be different tasks that you um, do with someone in order to sort of observe the productivity whereas in the credentials uh, checking case you don't directly observe the productivity but you um, look at something that can only be obtained by um, people with a certain productivity. Um, so let's look at one first at the credential setting and look at educational degrees um, in much more detail. Um, so the first question is would you use degrees for screening? How or do employers use degrees for screening? And how do we at CASE use degrees for screening? So what do we do differently um, than the employer can do without using our service? Um, if we use degrees for screening, and this is done by employers, um, I think Germany has a somewhat a bias towards or in favor of um, credentials, um, degrees. So this is something that is more important in Germany than it is in other countries. But it's also there in other countries. So um, also employers in the Netherlands, for example, wouldn't just hire anybody for a certain position, but they would want that person to have a at least a degree in higher education. Maybe they are less obsessed with the grade that is on that CV, um, on that degree, but they will want, uh, will want you to have a higher education degree in order to hire you. Um, but German employers also like to look at grades a lot. And I mean, you all have a GPA in Maastricht. And uh, well, just a couple of months ago, we received an application from, uh, from uh, a girl who was applying for an internship at CASE from Maastricht University. And her GPA in Maastricht was nine point something. I think 9.3 even and of course that's a really strong signal at least to me as someone who studied in Maastricht and did not have a nine point uh, something average by the way because that's really really hard to obtain um, that's a strong signal so I thought okay in order to get that she needs to be really smart and she needs to be really hard working so I guess I want to hire her uh, without checking anything else uh, sort of I had that impression really fast because um, yeah, that's how we as humans sort of process these types of information, right? We directly connect them to other things that are that are working for us. So um, if we talk about grades now, um, grades are one way to use uh, degrees for screening, right? In instead of using just binary, someone has a degree or someone does not have a degree, um, we can look at the grade on a CV. Um, and I would argue that this is a very imperfect way um, to determine the quality of the signal because we have huge differences in grading standards. So what I have here on the slide is we have an example um, from the Technical University of Munich. We have someone, well, we have a different grading system in Germany. So we grade from one to six. Um, one to four is a, is, a, is a pass with one being the best grade, four being the 5.5 in Maastricht in that sense. And then um, everything higher than four is a fail. So uh, that's uh, then similar to everything to five or lower in the, in, the, in the Dutch grading system. And here we can see that in at the Technical University of Munich, someone with a 2.0, that's probably the 7.5 uh, equivalent uh, in, in, in the, in the, on the Dutch grading scale, um, can be very different when compared to his uh, or her um, co-students, fellow students, and here at the Technical University of Munich, they give really bad grades. So someone with a 2.0 is among the best 10%. But um, the other example on the right, that's the University of Heidelberg. Um, this is psychology now, so not um, mechanical engineering, a different uh, study area. But here with a 2.0, you are one of the worst students in the entire study program because the average is much better. It's at 1.3 and you are in the bottom 4% of your study cohort. So um, just looking at the grade does not tell us a lot about um, how that person performed relatively to his or her fellow students and also doesn't tell us a lot about, well, where did that person actually study, right? So um, we, we, we also need to ask ourselves questions like, well, is this actually a good school? Is this a good program? Is it competitive? How, how, how good are the other students? Um, are they really strong? And um, we have, that's what I have on this slide now. So if we have differences in competitiveness, and I think with this example here, no one would argue with me that the London School of Economics is not the same as Maastricht University, which is not the same as Hochul School site. So we do have differences between these institutions. And um, I think you can put them in this case in a clear ranking. 
um, with the example we had before, Heidelberg is a good university, TU Munich is a good university, so we already see there is less uh, correlation between whether something is a good institution and whether some institution gives out good or rather harsh grades, so uh, the grading standard in some sense. Um, so we need to answer these questions in order to, to say whether a certain signal is, 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 is a good quality signal or a, a medium quality signal in order to make these in order to make these differences. And this is what we do at CASE. We solve these things um, with data. And if we think, well, how can... Uh, the great distribution example is pretty straightforward how we can solve that with data. We just need to have data on the great distribution and then we can see whether a 2.0 was actually a grade that was more common or rather um, less common and whether it was good or bad in a certain context. But how do we determine the quality of a university? How do we determine the quality of a certain subject at a certain university? Um, that's not so, not so easy. And the first thing that comes to mind is university rankings. Um, when, we talk about, when we talk about university rankings, um, then uh, we are talking about something that ranks the university. But the employer is not so interested in the university itself, but it's more interested in the graduates of that university and whether they are good or bad. And of course there is some correlation because there is prestige, um, there is something that, that uh, lots of students check those rankings before they, um, uh, in order to decide where they want to apply for their, for their study. Um, so they are being used and of course there is some correlation with uh, student quality. But this is at, at best indirect because what those rankings normally measure is, well, how many publications do the professors have? Um, does the university have an international profile, which is by itself nothing that adds value? Um, how well is the, the library um, equipped with books and uh, other things? Um, these, are, these are typical things that are ranked in a university ranking. Um, sometimes they, they also look at placements, which is already much closer to student quality. But normally a ranking is about the university and the employer does not really care about the university especially if we think um, that university quality is only a small part uh, to determine the quality of the graduates, right? Most of the things that you know now, you have not learned them at Master's University, right? So um, in order to uh, judge a university, we would have to sort of start with, well, this is the level of the students when they arrive. This is the level of the students when they leave. Well, let's do it the other way around. Um, so this is where they start. This is where they leave. And the difference in between well, that's the quality of the university. But the labor market, your future employer, that, that person doesn't care about the gap here. So were you that good or that? That doesn't matter to that person. All that person cares about is how good the graduates are when they leave university. And this is something that rankings usually not measure. So um, a better way to measure the quality of the students in a certain study program is to have standardized test routines, right? This is done when you apply for a master program. Most of you will probably have to do a GMAT, some maybe a GRE, but most people will probably have to do a GMAT. Why do they do a GMAT? Because they cannot assess just from your grade if you're a good or a bad student, because it strongly depends on the grading standard in your institution. And it depends on the quality of your institution in the, uh, strongly. So it depends on the competitiveness, right? It's easy to be in the, ten, in the, in the best 10% of a, very, of, of a group that is not very competitive. Then, then it's much easier to end up in the, in the top 10% than ending up in the top 10% of a group that is highly competitive. So being among the top 10% at uh, LSE in London is much harder than it is um, at Hochschule site because the competition is different and we need to understand these things. So a typical way to do this is look at standardized testing. And um, the GMAT is an example of such a standardized test. Everyone has to do the same test under the same conditions, and then um, we can compare the results. And that tells us something about the individual quality of a student. But this is sort of a fix that goes around this, right? So you say, I have a degree. Well, I don't really care about that degree. The signal is not good enough for me. I um, test the productivity. So the second screening scenario that we talked about um, a few slides back. So we, we don't look at signals that much, but we try to derive a productivity indicator ourselves. What we do at CASE is um, 
we do standardized tests in order to rank um, programs. So we wouldn't rank a university, but we would rank a certain subject at a certain university. And we do that also through standardized tests that we collect. And we do that through IQ and personality tests, and we'll talk about them um, and how they look like at the end. So we have an indicator that tells us how good the students are in a certain study program. So for example, in, in business at Maastricht University, and then we have a grade distribution that tells us which grade is how frequent. And also there we find differences um, also for the Netherlands. So Maastricht University gives out slightly better grades than Rotterdam, for example. So also in the Netherlands, we have these differences in, in grading standards. Um, so when we have these standardized tests, one thing that is important in order um, to be sure that this is actually a good proxy of the student quality and that it is relevant um, for later in the job market is to look whether what we are testing in those tests is actually relevant later in the job market. So when we talk about personality um, and uh, cognitive ability, um, IQ, then there's lots of literature and um, I have them here on, on the slide because it's really a big meter studies that uh, are very good and at the same time um, very informative about what abilities um, are valuable in the labor market. And uh, one of them, you see Professor Borchans there again, um, he's at Maastricht University. Um, he did a lot with personality and the, the role of personality later in the labor market. Um, but from these papers, we can see that if we do standardized tests in the form of cognitive or personality tests, that these are also relevant later in the labor market. So people who score good on those tests they will earn, for example, a higher salary later in life. And that means that these tests are somewhat um, predictive and that we can use them as a quality indicator for making comparisons between different universities. Um, otherwise, we could also derive a test and then we can use the test results in order to make differences. But if these differences don't show any prediction um, uh, regarding the later labor market, then we could also just use a dice to determine whether a certain university is good or bad. Um, yeah, and to sort of sum up what we do at CASE is that um, we use the, the grade distributions in order to understand how well someone performed locally compared to the fellow students. And then we use standardized test routines in order to understand how well this comparison group, um, the fellow students, uh, for example, at Maastricht University, how they compare to students in other study programs. So we have a within comparison through the grade distribution and we have a between comparison between university and study programs um, through our standardized tests in the form of IQ and personality tests. And um, so uh, we can have a look how, at how that works, how case looks like. Uh, there was a, a small hiccup here now and I think some people will be able to see that also in the video because I had a link on that slide and I want to click it to give you a, a live demo of uh, how uh, our tool looks like but um, that doesn't work if you're at the same time recording a video in PowerPoint, what I'm doing. So uh, I quickly um, took the results from the website and pasted them here on a slide. Um, we can have a look at how case looks like um, and an example that is maybe very practical to you. So we're looking at the University of Mannheim, uh, maybe similar to Maastricht in some regards in a way that it's a really good business school. We're looking at someone who's doing a bachelor in business with a GPA of 2.2. That's 7. Point, I don't know, let's say 7.3 roughly in Maastricht. And we have a graduation year in 2020. So the first thing we're looking at then is we're looking at the grade distribution, at the grade distribution of the business students in the bachelor program um, in Mannheim that are graduating in 2020, so this year. And this is the first um, graph that you can see on the slide. So we can see that the average grade is a bit better than that, right? So 2.2 is below average. I think the average is at 2.0, 1.9 roughly. So we're talking about someone who is below average in the um, student group that is studying business in Mannheim. But because Mannheim is a really good school, and that's something we can also see in our IQ and personality tests. So students from Mannheim will outperform other students in, in, in our standardized testing. Um, and that means someone who is below average, in this case, top 67%. So directly at the, at the margin between the, the last third and the, the, the middle third um, is actually above average compared to all um, business students in Germany. So we would say, 
um, compared to all business graduates. And we're just talking about someone who's in their bachelor's here. So we now when we talk about all business students, we're also comparing um, that person to students uh, who are obtaining a master's degree, for example. Um, that person will be top 38%, so much better in terms of um, the comparison to all business students. And this is now the combination already of local performance versus the benchmarking through the standardized tests, how good um, uh, the study program was. And then we have another metric, which is what we call the case score. So case subject score compares someone with all people in the same subject area. The case score compares him to all students in Germany. And there we can see that business students are somewhat below average on average. So they're really good business students, but students in other disciplines. So for example, physics or um, could be psychology or medicine in Germany because they're really tough to get in, that these students are more competitive in terms uh, of their performance on, on those standardized tests. So that student is below average in Mannheim, above average for business students, and really close to the average for students, for the student population as a whole. And um, of course, this looks completely different if we have someone who's really a top performer from Mannheim. If someone's good locally in Mannheim, then that person will also be better compared to business students or all students um, in our metrics. And it will also be different if we have someone who's below average, not in Mannheim, but uh, at a not so well school, um, that person will then also be worse in those metrics. So here we really take everything into consideration and companies can use that in order to um, get more information, um, especially more context information uh, out of a, a university degree. So by using case, you give much more power to the signal um, being the university degree in the sense that you get the context information that helps you to uh, understand what this actually means. Um, and uh, well, uh, giving you a compelling story is one thing, but in order to make sure that um, the instruments, the, um, the, the, the different diagnostic tools that we are using in order to decide who should be hired or not, in order to, to, to decide whether these tools are working or not, you should do a study. And uh, normally this is referred to as a validation study um, because, um, well, in psychology, there's also something like const construct valid validity. So whether things actually measure what they should measure. But the most important thing that we're looking here is at prediction. So is um, the instrument, the, the tool um, that we are using in this sense, the case score or an assessment test, is it actually predictive of what comes thereafter? Because if it's not, then we can throw a dice again and um, the, the tool is of no value, right? And this is something that's really important. You not just to sort of have, a, have an idea behind it, why it could work, but also to show that it works. And um, this is uh, something that's really important in HR and where HR departments um, can, can still get much better at because um, lots of the tools that are out there are actually not validated in a proper sense. Um, what we have here are results from an actual validation study that we've done together with Deutsche Post. It's for an internship program at Deutsche Post. And um, we have two different instruments here. So on the vertical axis, we have our case score. That was the last metric that you saw on the, on the previous slide. And here people, lower scores are better, right? Because we're talking about percentiles. So being in the top 10% is better than being in the top 50%. So um, on the vertical axis, um, the lower we are, the better, um, as can be seen by the good and bad sign. And on the horizontal axis, we have an online test that has, that's an assessment test. We did not develop that one. It was a different company developing that one. The Deutsche Post used it for this program. And in this um, uh, assessment test, people had to answer um, standard little cognitive exercises. I don't know exactly how it looked like. And this is scored in percent. So 0% means you got everything wrong up to 100%, so then more is better. And um, having these two instruments, we can divide all the applicants in two groups. And this is what the green triangle is doing. So everyone who is in the green triangle is in the um, southeast corner um, of the scatter plot, meaning that that person is good in terms of the two instruments, right? So he has on average a better case score and on, uh, on average also better uh, online test results and all people that are not in the green triangle, um, they are in the, in, the, in the lower half of the applicant um, population here. Um, 
And there are things that we can learn from this in terms of predictiveness and uh, predictability. And that is um, the colors of the dots. And I haven't said anything about them yet. So every dot is an applicant. Blue dots are the applicants that made it into the final assessment. So there was an assessment center. So the blue dots made it into a, a personal assessment center where they talked to people. They were assessed uh, throughout a whole day. Um, but the blue dots, they did not get a job offer. So after that assessment center, they were rejected. Whereas the green dots um, got a job offer after the uh, assessment center. And we can already see that um, most of the people who make it into the assessment center are in the green triangle. But more, we can see that all people who got a job offer are in that green triangle. So you can, just by using these two early screening criteria, you can already have a very good prediction of who is being hired in the end. Because lots of the blue dots, people who made it to the assessment center but were then rejected, are outside of that triangle. So by using the online test only or the case score only, you get a less precise estimate. By combining the two, you can make really good predictions about who is hired in the end. And you can make that a priori, so before the assessment center is conducted. So the company can now, um, using the two things together, they can hire better people or they can um, have less assessment centers, which is, a, which is a big cost saving because these things tend, tend to be really expensive. So there's lots of things that, that we can do here. But what we're predicting here in terms of um, uh, external uh, predictive validity is not whether someone is actually good on the job, but only whether someone is going to be hired. So this is, this is nice in a way to understand the process and how we can um, streamline the process. But this is not perfect in a way uh, of uh, validation because we're interested in whether these people are actually the better employees in the end. Maybe they made mistakes in who they hired. Um, so we have a look at that as well. But before, um, here's another uh, study from Simon Kucher and Partner. This is a very good uh, German consultancy. They do lots of um, pricing. So they're, they're, they're really good. Uh, it's an economics consultancy. They, uh, they sit in Bonn. Um, the, the headquarters are in Bonn, but they have offices all around uh, Germany and I guess also in the Netherlands. And they're also working with us. And here um, they sort of ask the question, okay, we know that we can combine the case score and our online test. So they have a different numerical assessment test. Um, but which one is essentially more predictive in who gets the job afterwards? So they have the case score, they have an online test, and thereafter they have uh, an interview that is normally conducted by a partner. Um, and in that interview, they determine who is going to be hired um, as, an, as an intern or as a consultant. So they have essentially two different um, uh, entry-level positions. You can do an internship or you can become a full-time consultant after your studies. Um, and there, it's not perfect to see because my video is now in the image, which is a bit problematic. Um, but um, we see uh, this A group. These are people who are really good in the online test and in terms of the case score. So this is sort of the, the best group in some sense. Then we have the B group. These are people who are good in terms of their case score, but not so good in terms of the online test. And we have the C group. These are people who are um, very good in the online test, but not so good in terms of their, of their case score. And then we can look at the probability of people from these groups getting an interview. And then we can look at the probability of people from these groups um, getting a job offer. And um, First, in this, in this A group, almost everyone gets an interview. So the chance of an interview is at 97%. It's very high. Um, and half of them get a job offer. But if we look um, into the uh, B group with the good case score, um, but the not so good online test, we see that only 20% actually get an interview. So they normally don't invite these people to an interview. But the same amount of people gets hired, right? So here also, uh, more than half of the people get hired and being hired again means a green dot uh, a blue dot means you got into the interview but you were not hired so the case score apparently is very predictive of who is being hired because even if the online test is bad um, the share is almost the same and then as a comparison and now you can't see the numbers for that um, we have people um, in the C group and they also almost always get an interview and that is because um, at the point where we did this study the online test was decisive in determining who will get to the interview and who will not get into the interview. And then they only did a, a small um, uh, 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 control group um, and so that we have group B. Um, so everyone got an interview, but less people were hired. So we see mainly um, blue dots 
uh, up there in the C group. And that shows us that um, the online test is predictive, um, also in combination with the K-score, uh, like we've seen on the previous slide with Deutsche Post, that works. But the K-score was actually more predictive in terms of who will, got, who will get the job later. And that led to then Simon Kucher slightly adjusting the hiring processes. Um, and for us, this was obviously very nice because um, the results hinted at the case score being a good predictor. And we can, um, uh, in, a, in a bit, we can talk about why that might be the case. So why um, something that adds information to a signal and uses past information in terms of a signal can be more um, predictive, can give more um, information than a standardized test. Um, we can talk about that a bit, but I did say that we also want to show something about the predictive validity in terms of um, who is actually the better employee, so who is more productive at their job. And in this course, you will talk a lot about how we can measure um, job performance, and this is really the, the holy grail of uh, this this uh, area of economics because it's really hard for some jobs to measure job performance. So if someone's a salesperson. Fairly easy, you look at how much bookings that person is making, so how much that person is selling. But if someone is uh, doing a, a job with less clear performance indicators, then it's really hard to determine uh, uh, job performance. Um, general solutions to that um, could be that there is a performance review. And this is also what happened at the um, German company Male. Male is not well known, but it's a very large manufacturer of car parts. So they don't make the cars, but they make lots of the things that go into the cars and um, they're really not small. It's a, it's, a, it's a large company, but they don't have a, have a consumer brand like all the other uh, big car brands. So of course, less people know them. And they have a trainee program. And um, we did a study within that trainee program. Um, and these are the results here. And they, they really uh, show us nicely why grades are not a good indicator, why the signals are broken if we don't if if we consider grades only, but why there is still information in that degree and we can uh, retrieve it, we can obtain it, we can get it out of there by using context information like we do with case. So first um, graph on the left um, is the probability that Male in their performance review was very satisfied with the trainee. On average, they were working for Male for two, more than two years here. So they were hired, they were working um, for Male for more than two years, and then were, Male derived a performance review. And this is the performance review we're looking at, and the probability that they were very satisfied in that performance review. And we plot that together with the GPA on the horizontal axis, so with the grade point average. And we see, again, remember, low grades are good in Germany, so it's the other way around than it is in Maastricht. Um, we don't see a lot there. We even see that the line is sloping in the wrong direction. So with Mahler, candidates with bad grades were better than candidates with good grades, and that's absurd. Um, and this strongly depends on the sample. So these people got hired not because of their 3.0 GPA, but in spite of it. So um, maybe they had something else that made them special, but we can see here that the grades uh, do not help us in order to determine who will be a good employee later um, and who will not be a good employee later. So grades really shouldn't be used that strongly in, 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 in candidate selection. Um, and that kind of shows us that, well, maybe the signal is not so good as we, as we want it to be. And that's then problematic for you because, um, remember, you're not only going to master university in order to learn something, but in order to get a signal at the end that says, hey, that's a smart guy. And if that signal is not working, it's not so. It's not. A, it's not good information for you. So what we do is, first, at case we calculate a local percentile. So instead of using grades, we use um, what you could see in the first graph with case. So we sort of you say someone is locally compared to the fellow students in the best 10, 20, or whatever um, percentage range, and um, then the line goes in the right direction. So at least um, people who are locally better they will be better employees on average, but it's not significant. Um, the sample size is also not huge here. We're talking about 61 hires. Um, it, it's very hard to conduct a sample like this because you have to hire someone and employ them for two years before you can get a performance review. So getting a large data set here is much harder than it is um, for other types of studies. Um, so it's going in the right direction. It's not significant. Um, it's not big, so um, this wouldn't help us much. But if we combine this information, so how well someone uh, um, performed locally, if we combine that with the information of uh, how competitive a study program is, and that's the case score, you can't see it because my image is in front of it, but believe me, 
the, the, the graph at the very right um, has the case score on the lower axis. So that's the third graph um, you, can, you can get from case, the third metric that compares you to all other students in Germany. There we have a huge impact suddenly. So um, we can see that students who had a very bad case score, they were only um, very good employees in 10% of the cases, whereas students with a very strong case score um, in almost 75% of the cases, Marla was very satisfied with them after two years. So this shows us that the case score is also predictive in who becomes a, a good employee afterwards. Um, we did a similar study with uh, Simon Kucha. After the results I showed you um, two slides ago, they were interested in doing something like this as well. Um, the results are virtually the same, so I don't have to go over them again. But what is interesting is that they have a different performance metric here. So instead of using a performance review, what they use is um, the probability for an on-time promotion. So Simon Kucha is a consulting company. You might have heard this, that they have these up or out schemes, so they have certain time intervals that you should spend until you get, uh, get the next promotion and if you're not being promoted for a certain amount of time they will lay you off because um, they have uh, lots of young people coming in and only the people who are being promoted they can stay in the company. Um, so for them the most important performance metric is does someone make promotion on time? Are they, uh, do they make it to the next consultant rank? Do they become a senior consultant and so on and so forth? Uh, forced. And what we see here is essentially the same story. Grades do not predict that. Um, if we um, look at grades locally, so we put them in the right context, then this changes and it gets really um, predictive once we combine local performance with the um, performance benchmarking through standardized tests as we do with CASE. Um, so this, this works nicely. Um, so now, <clears throat> in order to have a good discussion later, um, well, it's going to be a boring discussion because I'm going to be discussing with myself, but in order to have a good discussion, we need to understand more about um, standardized testing uh, routines. So um, I'm going to uh, talk a bit now about how can we measure productivity. And there are lots of tests. Essentially, there's even criticism uh, for the GMAT and the GIE a lot because apparently they don't measure what they should. So the, the relationship between GMAT and GIE and later academic performance is not as strong as some people might think, especially the GIE, which is done for economists, I think, uh, got a lot of uh, critique in the past. Um, but they are psychological tests, and these tests are also done in a diagnostic setting when you apply for a job. So it could be that if you apply somewhere, you already made the experience that you have to go through an online assessment and that you have to ask, answer certain questions and certain tasks. And um, we can have a look at these tests, and then I can discuss uh, what's the advantage of a test, what's the advantage of, uh, of a case score, um, and um, yeah, that's that's the idea for the for the rest of the of the lecture. So today. Um, let's live in a simple world. So psychologists will probably disagree with me, um, but cognitive ability, at least in the economic setting, is is similar or the same as IQ essentially in the way that non-cognitive ability, and this is probably even the larger sin to psychologies, is sort of being equated to personality. Okay, so we have um, IQ, which is um, how, uh, how cognitively able you are. There we make the difference between fluid and crystallized um, ability, uh, cognitive abilities. Fluid IQ is sort of your, your base intelligence, what happens in your head, things like um, 3D vision or uh, puzzle solving and these kind of things that are really abstract. Whereas crystallized intelligence is how you crystallize, how you show your intelligence to the outside. So this is things like language. Um, this can be um, things like short-term memory and these. Uh, so how you, your intelligence is sort of shown to the outside. There are different constructs um, within uh, IQ that are measured by a proper IQ test. Proper IQ test is something that is normally done in an interview situation, uh, so one-on-one -on -one interview situation by a psychologist and requires something like two hours uh, on average to be tested. And this is something that is not feasible um, for hiring processes. So in recruitment, um, whenever we talk about cognitive ability tests, we will have something that is normally conducted online, something that is much shorter and um, also in that sense then a bit less predictive than the uh, clinical IQ test that psychologists would do. Um, what I have on the next slide is, uh, is a very standard uh, uh, exercise from these tests. This is a, it's a matrix test. Um, Raven matrices are in many uh, 
well, in many ways considered a gold standard. It's um, certainly fluid intelligence, not crystallized intelligence, and I think you'll understand uh, as soon as you see the items. The other thing we're going to be talking about, I said, is personality, often equated with being non-cognitive ability. So all the ability that sort of determines the outcome so of, of, of how productive you are, that is not cognitive. So um, an example of that could be conscientiousness, which is um, uh, whether you're on time, whether you like to do your tasks, uh, whether you are productive, whether you like being productive, whether you are tidy, um, whether you're motivated. And these kind of things, of course, play a role for the outcome, but they're not cognitive ability. It's not that you couldn't solve it, but it's how much you want to solve it a bit. Um, and we'll have a look at these. Um, for personality, um, there are different models for personality, but there is one um, standard in a sense that, uh, it, it, and it's called the Big Five model. So we have five different personality traits, five different dimensions that classify our personality. Um, and there's been a lot of debate, not recently, it's a bit longer, um, there's, there's been a lot of debate in, in, in psychology how many dimensions that should be. And um, what they did in order to come up with the Big Five model is they had a huge pool of statements about one's personality, about yourself, and we'll have a look at uh, some of these statements in a bit. And you had to say whether you agree to that statement, so whether it fits to yourself or whether it doesn't really, whether it applies to you. And um, asking a huge pool of um, statements, they then did a factor analysis. And that's a statistical tool that tells you how many groups do I need in order to put all these statements together. And the idea is that within one group, the statements correlate strongly with each other. So if you are, if a certain statement is very applicable to you and another statement is in that group, that statement will also be very applicable to you. So they, 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 they are strongly grouped together. And between these groups, the correlation is essentially zero. So they're supposed to be not correlating with each other, meaning that we're really talking about a different um, dimension, a different personality trait, something that is not related to this. And these factor analyses um, tell us that we should have three to seven dimensions in most applications it will be five. And this is something that's been done in the, in, the, in the 60s. There were four different groups of psychologists that worked heavy on this. Um, they're on the slide, but they all sort of came up with the same result. Um, and, and that's always a good sign. So four different group of research, groups of researchers try to solve the same question and they come up with a very similar result. That should give you some confidence. And um, what we are normally using is something that's, uh, that goes back to Goldberg. It's called the International Personality Item Pool, IPIP, and we use it because it's free to use. Um, in clinical practice, you will, also in diagnostics, you will often see something that's, uh, that's based on Costa McRae. That is, for example, the new FFI. Um, it's very similar, but this one costs in order to, to, to do it. So if you're ever in a situation where you, you want to test personality in your later life, maybe remember this. They're very good options in order to test personality and they are for free, so you don't have to pay for this. And um, we collect these data in a, in, a, in a big yearly study that we're doing. We tested more than 300,000 students by now and um, using a test that we have to pay for is just not feasible because uh, we don't have such a research budget. So what are the five um, traits? What are the five different personality dimensions? We have here conscientiousness. This is, um, as I explained previously, um, how conscientious to, you are in a sense that you are on time, that you are punctual, that uh, you like things to be tidy, that you always do everything on time, that you're sort of planning ahead, um, that you're organized, and this strongly correlates with um, labor market performance, as can be seen in the meta studies that I, uh, that I cited um, uh, uh, lots of slides back. Um, they show that conscientiousness is strongly related to labor market outcomes. So conscientious people typically earn more money than people who are not conscientious. We have extraversion, one of them uh, that is probably self-explanatory to most. It's um, whether you're extroverse or introverse, whether you like interacting with other people or whether you rather like staying to yourself. We have emotional stability. Um, the opposite of that, you also find it often in Big Five um, uh, tests that they phrase it negatively, then it's called neuroticism. Um, it's whether you're emotionally stable or whether you sort of uh, are prone to um, certain emotional uh, diseases even. So people who, are, who easily get depressed, for example, they will have low emotional stability. Um, we have agreeableness, um, whether you are willing to agree with other people. So whether you always have to get your position through or whether you are a team player in a way. 
Um, we have openness and this is openness to experience. So to learn or to experience something new, for example, uh, could be a, a new type of cuisine um, that you like to eat foreign food, but it could also be a new school of, of thinking. So new ideas, new concepts, new models, theories. Um, and this does correlate also with cognitive abilities, the strongest out of the five. Um, even though it is not cognitive ability, it's not whether you are good at solving things, but it's whether you are, whether you like experiencing new things, whether you're open to that. I have a couple of statements on my next slides to give you examples of how they look like. Um, but before I do that, this is something out of my own research. Um, this is the uh, differences in personality between different um, subjects. And we know that this is a selection effect. So people who select into certain subjects already from the beginning, they have different personalities instead of the subject changing their personalities. That's, uh, that's uh, always a debate whether business and economics students are the way because they decided to study business and economics or whether the discipline, what they learn in university sort of transforms them and, and, and makes them into rational um, number driven people. Um, what do we see here? Well, let's go through the business and economics example. Um, as a fun little exercise, we see that business and economics students are less agreeable than the average. So they want to get their own opinion through. They are very conscientious, so they're very organized, they're on time. Um, they're rather extroverted. We don't have a significant deviation in terms of emotional stability, even though there are signs that they are, hints that they are rather more than less emotionally stable. And they are not open to new experiences. Um, so this is the average selection into, into our discipline. Uh, it looks a bit frustrating. If we um, maybe contrast this to pedagogy and psychology students who also have to work with people, they are very agreeable. So that's a, that's a difference. They're not so conscientious, not organized. Um, in terms of extroversion, we don't find anything. Same for emotional stability. And they are very open to new experiences. Um, so this kind of shows us what people um, decide to study what disciplines in a way. The explanatory power. So if you, from this, then try to predict what someone is going to study, um, this is not going to work great because personality is, is very broad. People have very different personalities. So being able to de detect something on the mean, something that's significant as we, as we did here, is one thing. But that does not mean that from their personality you can perfectly predict their subject. So don't, don't overstretch these results. But we do see, see that on average there are differences between people that are not, but they are not, um, not too representative of every single individual. So there, there will also be business and economic students who are very agreeable and there will be psychologists who are not agreeable at all. So let's have a look at some statements. Um, I make plans and stick to them. Give you a second to think always. Um, this is an item that is from the pool of items uh, of conscientiousness. So this tells you whether someone is organized making plans. This is what conscientiousness is. I panic easily. That's emotional stability, right? People who panic easily, they are less emotionally stable. But this is only one item. So uh, typically in a test, you will have to do at least 10 items per domain or something like that in order to get, a, get an estimate that is somewhat predictive of your, of your own individual personality. I insult people. That's agreeableness. So if you insult people, you are not agreeable. Um, even though in some situations it has been shown that um, being not agreeable can even be helpful, but not at the beginning of your career. Uh, this is for higher level management positions where in certain situations it can be good if you sort of push your own opinion through. Um, at least that has been shown in some studies. I have excellent ideas. This is um, openness. So whether you like new things and whether you like having new ideas. Um, and the last one is I am the life of the party, and this is extroversion, right? So whether you like engaging publicly with lots of people, um, you should be extroverts for that. Okay, so let's think we are back in the recruitment situation. So you are applying at a certain company and someone is doing this test with you. More items, so this was only five items, they maybe do 50, but do you see any problem if this is done that way? Um, it's a rhetorical question, of course, because I'm talking to myself, but um, I think most of you will see um, right away 
that you will probably not be honest in answering these statements, especially if some of these statements are, I insult people. Most of the most of you probably when they're applying somewhere, they will say, no, I don't insult other people. And I hope most of you don't. Um, but also with the other ones, I panic easily. Uh, even if you're emotionally instable, you would not say I panic easily, but you would, you would cheat, you would lie. And that's perfectly rational because you want to have the job. And um, that's the problem with personality. But it's very hard to measure personality without the person who is being tested um, cooperating. So it's really hard to measure your personality if you don't want me to measure your personality. And that means that in high stakes situations like application situations, it's really, really hard to conduct um, a good personality test. Um, of course, people thought about that and then they have items that are coded inversely and so on and so forth. But if someone really wants to lie, um, it will always happen. And especially on domains um, that are predictive, like um, agreeableness, uh, um, uh, uh, Emotional stability and conscientiousness. People do tend to do tend to to um, change their answers in a way that, um, yeah, they 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 show what the company wants to hear. Okay, <clears throat> so this is how I did it last year. Last year I had a nice lecture room in Maastricht, um, and I could uh, give out uh, pieces of paper with IQ tests on them, uh, so that people um, could solve them. Uh, for themselves. Uh, I'm not going to do this uh, today because I can't, but we'll still have a look at the items and I will, at least for a minute or two per item, I will I will shut up, uh, have, let you have a look at it, and then uh, I will give the results right away. So these are Raven matrices type of questions. So they're not actual Raven matrices in a way that they're from that specific test, but they're very close to to these uh, Raven matrices items. And um, they can, this is something you, that could happen to you when you apply for a job somewhere. So this is something that companies like to do in order to determine who they want to invite for an interview, for example. So let's have a look at the first one. Your um, task is to find the symbol that belongs in the bottom right corner of the three times three matrix. I guess that you can also pause the video. Maybe that's much more efficient than me waiting in front of my camera. So if you haven't solved it yet, just pause the video and think some more. Um, I will give the, the I will do this. I will spoiler now. So the correct answer here is the dot. You can see that they are additive in a certain way. So in the top left corner, we have all the symbols together, right? We see the big circle, we see the square, we see the line, and we see the dot in the middle. And then once you move from uh, left to right, you see something. Uh, you see that the two things um, in the in the middle and the right column. If you add them together, you get the thing that's in the in the first row, left column. And the same is true if you go the rows, right? So if we stay in the first column and look at the second and third row, we'll see if we add them together, we have the symbol in the top left. So. Um, in order for that logic to hold, we need a dot in the bottom uh, right corner, so third row, uh, third column, because if we add that dot with a circle, we will get what we have in the first column, last row, and if we add the dot with a square, then we'll get what we have in the third column, first row. So that's the answer here. It's a rather easy item. Getting more difficult. Again, if you want to solve it by yourself, uh, pause the video. Um, I will give the answer now. So what we see here is always a combination of three lines, right? We have lines on the outside and we have one line in the inside. Um, and in, if we look in the first row, first column, this looks a bit like an H. We have two short lines in the outside and we have one long line connecting the two. In the inside right and then if we look at the second row second column so the one in the middle ignore the rotation for a moment we'll talk about the rotation soon but just look at the length of the lines you will see that we have the same symbol but now we have short lines on the outside and a short line connecting the two inside right so and all these symbols have that 
in common. So if we look first row, second column, we'll see something that has two long lines on the outside and a short line on the inside. It's not, a, not an H, it's a different symbol, but the pattern is the same, right, in terms of long and short lines. Um, and these, these change, right? So if we look first row, second column, um, we see long on the outside, short on the inside. If we go along the diagonal, we'll see um, that the lines are of equal, uh, that we have the long line on the inside and the short lines on the outside. So that's second row, third column. And if we then continue the diagonal, so going out of the matrix and then coming back in the third line, first column, we see short lines everywhere. So short lines outside, but it's always the same kind of shape if we ignore the rotation for a moment. And the same holds true if we start off first row, first, uh, first row, third column, and then second row, first column, and then third row, second column. We'll also have this changing between short and long lines. Plus, whenever we move along the diagonal one, we get a rotation, right? We get a 45 degree rotation counterclockwise. And that's essentially everything that's happening. So the correct answer here is Okay, obviously the one that you can't see because my video is in front of it, it's um, an H that is lying on the side, right? So a long line here, short line there, and then a long line on top. An H like this, that will be the right answer uh, in, this, in this setting here. And now a last item, uh, even, even trickier. So we know because we, we, um, when, when you derive such a new test, of course, first you think about what an item uh, you want to develop and uh, try to have an idea, but then just thinking about an item and giving it out to people is not how you construct such a test, but you need to collect data on it so that you can normalize the distribution, that you know how many um, answers people normally answer right, so uh, answer correctly, and you um, need to see whether items are essentially predictive. So if the, having the correct answer to one item is completely unrelated to all other items, all other questions, then probably this is not a good question. Um, so there are lots of things that you should do and keep in mind when trying to develop such a test. Um, again, if you don't want me to give the answer and you want to think for yourself, pause. Um, I will give the solution now. Um, and we have two different types of logic elements here and they're called, you know, maybe end and or logic, right? Mathematical conditions. Um, here we have an exclusive or and that means it's one or the other, but not both. Um, and we'll look how that works. On the inside, so the lines, the thin lines connecting to the dot on the inside, this is an AND condition. So there will only be a line if before there was a line in two instances. So if we start in the first column, uh, in the first row, and then go from left to right, you see first row, first column, we have um, two thin lines, one going to the southeast and one going to the northwest. When we move to the right, we see that there we have a line going to the southeast and a line going to the northeast. So the only line that they have in common and condition needs to be both is the line going to the southeast. So if we check first row, third column, that's the only thin line we see there. If we stick in the first column and go through the rows, then again, first column, first row to the northwest and the southeast. If we check the second row, we'll see to the north, uh, sorry, north, west and southeast. In the second row, we see northwest and southwest. So the only thing they have in common is the line going to the northwest. And that's the one you see first column, third row. If we continue this logic, you see that in the, in the last row, but also in the last column, none of the thin lines are shared. So we won't have a thin line in the solution because the end, co uh, end condition cannot be satisfied here in that sense. So we have a dot in the middle, but we don't have any lines connected to that dot. And that already gives away the solution. So you don't even have to understand what happens on the outside. It's probably the, um, from all the solutions, the one at the um, top in the um, left column. On the outside, I can also give you the rule. It's an exclusive or. So you either have one line or the other, but not both or not nothing. So if we start with the first row, we see that we have a line at the top and at the bottom. And if we look at the first row, second column, we have a line at the left and at the bottom. So at the bottom, we have two lines and that is both, but we don't want both, right? So it's one or the other, but not both and not nothing. 
So at the top, we only have one line. So the XOR condition is satisfied. First row, third column, we have a line. Um, the same applies to the line on the left. The first column doesn't have a line there. The second column does have a line there. So the OR condition is satisfied. We get a line. But at the bottom, we have um, a line in both scenarios. So that's why it's XOR. It's exclusive OR. Um, so both cases, a line means no line. In the sense, negative, negative is plus. And on the right, we don't have any lines, and any lines also does not satisfy the XOR condition. And if we continue to do it like that, then we'll also see that the answer fits in terms of the outside. Because, for example, if we check the last column now, um, we don't have a line at the left, because in the last column, first row and second row, in both cases, there's a line on the left, XOR. We don't get a line there. But all the other instances, all the other lines are unique, right? We only have one line at the top in the first row, and we only have lines at the uh, right and the bottom in the second row, meaning that we get these other three lines on the outside, we get them. And this is how you can solve these kind of tests. They should measure cognitive ability, meaning it sort of it should be something that's inert to you, that's not changeable, but of course you can learn these things. So if you ever end up in a recruitment situation, being prepared for these type of questions and having, having some experience with them certainly does not hurt. Okay, so why is this maybe considered a gold standard? What does this measure? And then the second question, is, that, is this a good measure of job performance? Okay, what does this measure? I think we know that by now. It's a fluid type of intelligence, right? It's base intelligence. Um, the reason why this is considered a gold standard is that lots of problems that a test can have do not apply to these type of tests. So, for example, no language is necessary here. You can do this test with uh, someone who doesn't speak your language and still sort of, because there are um, logical patterns behind that, if that person is cognitively able, he will be able to solve that test even without you being able to, to communicate to that person. So you, you could give it, um, and, and that's, that means it's culturally fair, and that's an advantage. So if I give someone a, a, a test that is strongly reliant on the language in a certain country and that person is not good in that language, well, then we have to ask ourselves, is that language necessary for the job? But if it's not, then this is, this is, this is much better. So this is a, a gold standard in the terms that it really um, measures fluid intelligence in a culturally and language neutral setting. And that is something that is good. Next question, is this a good measure of job performance? Well, in a way, yes. Um, because uh, if you're cognitively able, you will also be able to solve other problems faster. And in many situations, that is important. But to be very fair, in order to be good at your job, you don't have to solve these puzzles all the time, right? You also have, there's a lot of motivation in there. Some of the problems are just much easier and you need to be able to solve different things at the same time. This is really abstract. So some people maybe have lots of fluent intelligence, but they lack the crystal intelligence necessary in order to sort of get their good ideas across. Um, so in that sense, it's, it's a very narrow measure of ability, right? And um, in a job setting, you need a much broader measure of ability in order to have a really good predictor of, of um, job performance. That's why some IQ tests, they test other subdomains. So they not only test Raven matrices like these, but they also test for language and they test for other things that are important to get a broader understanding um, of cognitive ability. And then we could really speak of of IQ in that sense. But also, it's from another perfect, uh, perspective not an ideal indicator of job performance, and that is it's also very, it's not just very narrow in the type of um, question you are answering, it's also very narrow considering the time frame, right? When you do these items, it's um, maybe 20, 30 minutes uh, in an online test uh, setting. Um, that's very narrow, right? You could have a good day, you could have a bad day. So it has, uh, it has those daily differences in, in, uh, in performance that, that are still in there. But it's also, it's also very narrow in terms of um, motivation, right? Um, it's very easy to be motivated for 20 minutes if you want a job to, in order to do this test. But in order to do your job well, you need to be motivated for two years or three years and not just on the spot uh, fighting against the timer, trying to solve these questions, but you don't have the time pressure, you don't have the external pressure, and you still need to stay motivated and concentrated and sort of show your 
your cognitive ability. So it's not just limited in the term of um, uh, question that we're asking, but it's also limited in terms uh, of timing. And um, there are also some aspects in there um, that show us that this is a more short-term measure of performance compared to job performance being a more long-term measure of performance. And this is also what we find in our studies. So here we are back to the case study um, with Mahler and um, I showed you results already for um, the predictive validity of the case score, but they also had an assessment test in there. You can't see it because it's also again behind my video probably, but um, the assessment test there did not correlate with job performance and the assessment test they did was a matrix test like the one you've just seen. So they did a test that was very, very similar um, to what you've just seen and it did not correlate with job performance. That does not mean that people don't have to be cognitively able at Mahle, but it means that apparently this test was too narrow to predict job performance. And if we contrast this now to the case score, so the case score being um, our contextualization through our algorithm of um, academic performance, um, then academic performance is a long-term measure. So in order to obtain a degree from Maastricht University, you'll be studying for, well, let's say three years, some of you may be a little longer. Um, so you need, to be you need to stay motivated over a longer period of time. It's also broader in terms of the exercises that you're doing. Of course, in order to be successful in Maastricht, sometimes there are these really logical tasks that you need to solve in certain assignments or certain exams. Maybe think about um, QM1 or QM2 in your first year. But then there are also um, other things. There's group work, there's presentation, things that are much stronger correlated with, um, with a more fluid type of intelligence maybe, um, which are also much stronger correlated with personality that is not measured through the test. So there, there's not just the cognitive ability part, but there's also um, other aspects that are important in order to be successful in your study. And these things are in there. And um, once we contextualize them, then academic degrees work really well um, as a screening tool. But if we don't, if we only look at the grade or if we treat it as a binary signal in the way, does that person have a university degree, yes or no, then it doesn't really work. And then it would be much better to do a test. But if we understand um, and contextualize uh, such a signal, we can get a lot of information out of it. And that's essentially the bottom line of my presentation. Um, we don't live in a simple world. That's in a simple world. That's why separating equilibria and all these theoretical things um, are not really that applicable to the hiring situation. But signals do exist and signals do work if we can get as much information out of them uh, as we want to. Okay, so if there are any questions, uh, please come uh, to the Q&A session. Um, on this slide, there's also my Maastricht email address. It's uh, maybe also cut off, but I think everyone knows how it finishes. So it's philip.siegers at maastrichtuniversity.nl. So if you have any teaching research related questions, send me an email there. But if you don't have these type of questions, but you have more questions about case, um, or even maybe interested in doing an internship with us. Um, this is our team. So we are um, located in Cologne, Germany. Um, we are by now, the image is a bit old. Also the distance between uh, us shows that this is pre-corona. That was in February. We're by now um, 20 people. Um, a very nice startup team. Um, we're working with very cool customers in Germany. I think some of them you've already seen. Um, through the case studies and uh, we mainly have positions in, in data science. So that's people driving our product forward, developing new algorithms, new um, AI tools in order to get as much information out of a CV as possible. And at the same time, we have people working in business development. So these are the people who then reach out to our customers and try to explain our scoring. And um, exactly those are the, the, the two positions where we're looking for interns. And if that's interesting, for you, um, drop me an email at uh, pks uh, at candidate-select.com. And uh, yeah, see some of you in the Q&A session uh, on Monday. This is Friday. Uh, no, this is Thursday. So that means I even have no idea who won the US election. Um, that's also a very interesting statistical problem, but nothing we're going to be talking about now. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope you enjoyed uh, this lecture. Um, great success in your studies given this um, very interesting time we're having at the moment. And uh, yeah, if there's anything, feel free to reach out. Thanks and bye.